We trust the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. Okay, so so if on the one side, you know, again, one of the critiques, we've gone through so many critiques <laughs> during this episode, but if one of them was, you gross, why are you using this kind of graphic language? Um, another one is that you are theologizing. You're, 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 you, are, you are turning things abstract, which for women are very real, very concrete. I want to read you, it's a kind of long Twitter thread from Sheila Gregoire, um, who you quote positively in the book, but she has been critical of Beautiful Union. So let me read this tweet. Uh, she writes this. In the renewed discussion about Josh Butler's book, Beautiful Union, a theological discussion on sex, many men are upset at the women who are criticizing it. So let me explain. Men have the privilege of seeing this book as a fun theological intellectual exercise. Women do not. Men have the luxury of wondering about typologies and icons with sex because it can merely be that intellectual exercise. For us, women, it can't. To us, this is about our vaginismus rates, our inorgasmia, our marital rape. It's about betrayal trauma, objectification, and victimization. According to our surveys of 25,000, 95% of the married evangelical men debating about this book will reach climax almost every time. Only 48% of women will. And 72% of men think they do enough foreplay, even if she doesn't reach climax too. To talk about the centrality of the male climax is extra frustrating to the 42-year-old woman who has yet to climax, but has dutifully been, quote, hospitable to her husband two to three times a week for 17 years, like she's been told. Men will have sex without pain. 35% of women will experience pain, either in the postpartum stage or from conditions like vaginismus, a sexual dysfunction that is largely an evangelical one. Evangelical women have vaginismus rates of 22.7%, more than two times the general population. Our research for the Great Sex Rescue found that much of the elevated risk for pain is caused by messages like the ones in Beautiful Union. Around 20% of evangelical women will be victims of marital rape. To those women, a theological discussion of a man's climax as a generous gift feels like a slap in the face, especially when coercion isn't clearly spelled out. As my daughter and co-author Becca Lindenbach recently said, quote, women were crying out that they were being hurt, and then we were called Twitter mobs and chastised for not having the ability to be reasonable and unemotional about this. But that's a privilege men have that women don't have. These issues surrounding male-centric sexuality and leadership are cerebral for men. They are visceral for women. It's easy to debate differing opinions when you're not the one bearing the cost of these theological differences. Men are not more responsible than women because they are able to disconnect emotion from these discussions. They are able to disconnect emotionally from these discussions because they are not affected by the outcome. Their ease with which they can have these debates without it causing distress, rather than being seen as evidence of intellectual actualization should be recognized for what it is, the privilege of not having to experience the real world ramifications. This is Sheila again, not her daughter. Exactly. This is visceral to us. It is not merely intellectual. Please listen to the women. We surveyed, we surveyed 20,000 evangelical women for you about evangelicalism's teaching about sex right here. And she links to her book, the great sex rescue. Now, I think these are some very legitimate and serious questions, and I, I know it's probably impossible to respond to everything in here. We, I, I think we have responded, actually, in some ways to, to some of the concerns here, um, but just let us know. I mean, how would you respond to the critique? Yeah, great question. Well, yes, first, an important starting point is that Sheila and I share a common concern to address sexual abuse and the mistreatment of women. Uh, I address abuse strongly in the book, as I have throughout my ministry. We agree that there's a need for care in how Christian authors teach about sex. In the editorial process for this book, we had multiple layers of sensitivity reviews from survivors of sexual abuse and a professional female sensitivity reviewer, and the book was received astoundingly positively. I've received many messages from survivors recently who've said, I don't get the critique. I read the book and I didn't have that tone or message at all. Like, I loved it. Now, that's not to discount one perspective, but to say there's not just one monolithic perspective mm. here. Uh, second, we have to clarify what we mean by research. Uh, Shanti Feldhahn is a Harvard-trained researcher who's been doing qualitative research on sex and marriage for decades and writing on this as a Christian. Uh, her books have sold millions of copies. And her new book is amazing, by the way, Secrets of Sex and Marriage with Dr. Michael Seitzma. Uh, but Sheila's also critiqued Shanti with the same critiques as having damaging male-centric teachings, uh, which even escalated to dis disparaging personal comments about Shanti and her family. And Shanti responded in a public statement, and one of her points was this. I'm just going to read it here. It says, uh, she says, the survey that forms the basis of Sheila's book appears to be primarily of women with a particular point of view. 
In a survey of 20,000 respondents, close to half of respondents appear to be Sheila's existing followers, who had heard multiple times from her that those teachings were damaging. Just as concerning, many other respondents were recruited with the leading message, such as, ever feel like the Christian sex and marriage advice we get is just kind of, well, off somehow? Let's change that. She goes on. It is contrary to good research practice to recruit a sample with an existing viewpoint and which is primed to respond in a certain way and then ask them, how do you feel about this viewpoint? There's value in hearing from those people and those viewpoints, but the results must be viewed as results from Christian women of that viewpoint rather than Christian women as a whole. So I, I like how Shanti says these are viewpoints we need to listen to, and we do, I do, but we also need to be wary of thinking that these surveys represent Christian women as a whole. Now, third, I never say there's a duty of hospitality. Like that's putting words in my mouth that I've never said that I would never say. And, and apparently this is a tactic that Sheila's crew has used with loads of different leaders, mischaracterizing or misrepresenting their views with words that they've never used or pulling the words out of context where there was more nuance. Uh, it's like an outrage marketing tactic. Now, I never say wives need to be sexually available to their husbands, and I never would. Like that sounds ridiculous to me. What I do say is that sex is mutual self-giving. A husband and wife both give to and both receive from each other. And I'm assuming the Christ and church frame of loving, consensual, mutual freedom and joy. Now, husbands and wives both practice generosity, like giving their bodies to each other, and both practice hospitality, welcoming the body of the other. Yet there is also an iconographic reality, a sacred symbolism that God has inscribed in our bodies, in which a wife receives her husband within herself, her body. Hospitality is welcoming someone into intimacy, vulnerability, and communion. And what more intimate, vulnerable communion is there than this? Now, to be clear, like some people hear hospitality and they think of like Martha Stewart or 1950s domesticity, and that is not what we're talking about. Like hospitality is a rich theological term rooted in the God who prepares a table for us and who welcomes us into life with him. It implies agency. Like you choose who you invite into your home and when you invite them. So this is not saying wives give your husband sex whenever he wants. Like, no, you have agency in when you want to enter the marital embrace. And husbands respect that, right? Like if you're not putting her needs as your bride above your own, you're not reflecting Christ. And wives, if you don't feel the freedom to say no, like this is a problem with your husband, not you. Marital rape and sexual abuse in marriage are real and they are evil. And there are resources to help you, uh, such as Darby Strickland's book, Is It Abuse? Or Leslie Vernick's The Emotionally Destructive Marriage? Or the website, flyingfreenow.com. Uh, we've made some revisions to the next printing of the book to make this abundantly clear. But I think within the broader tone and content of the book as a whole, it's obvious. Hmm. And fourth... And finally, I'd say this is that my book is not a how to book or a sex menu, right? Like it's focused on the greater iconic realities that God has designed sex to point to. I'm Patrick. Thanks for watching this video. If you're passionate about ending tribalism in the church and giving Jesus your allegiance, you're not alone. We have a podcast and a book. They're both called Truth Over Tribe. You can download the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can buy the book on Amazon. I hope you'll check them out.